Hello and welcome back to another episode in the Introduction to Memory Forensics series. In this video, we're going to continue to develop our skills using volatility to find malware within a given memory image. I've created a Windows 10 virtual machine and infected it with fake malware, and then I captured the memory from that VM so that we could practice analyzing it. So in the next section of the video, we'll fire up volatility and start our investigation by looking for suspicious processes. We'll look for anything that stands out and start pulling threads, pun intended, to see where it leads us. Next, we'll look for suspicious network connections. And then in the last section of the video, we'll discuss ways to detect process injection and process hollowing, some of which we've covered in a previous episode in this series. And finally, we'll discuss how to extract the suspicious process executables from memory and write them to disk, as well as how to extract memory associated with those processes. So let's get started. Okay, so here we are in the SIFT workstation VM that I've built, and you can see that we're looking at the memory directory where we see a file conveniently named memdump underscore win10x64 underscore 15063.mem. I've named the memory capture that we're going to be analyzing after the correct volatility profile that we'll need to use to analyze it. Now, oftentimes we won't know which profile to use ahead of time, and we'll need to run something like image info or the more capable KDBG scan to determine that correct profile. In this case, of course, we don't need to do that. The problem, however, is that unfortunately, the version of volatility that ships with the SIFT workstation, and again, this is completely up to date, does not include a profile for 15063. So for example, if I run vol.py dash dash info, and grep for win10x64, you'll see that we have 10586 and 14393. What we're going to need to do is actually go ahead and pull down the newest version from the GitHub repo. And I actually created a video called Volatility Profiles in Windows 10 that explains a bit about how to do this. We'll start by going ahead and grabbing the GitHub URL here. So we'll copy this. And then we'll go back to here and we'll do a git clone and go ahead and paste in that URL. And we'll go ahead and let this clone. Now we have a volatility directory, which we can change into. And if we run Python vol.py dash dash info, and we once again grep for win 10 x 64, this time, we'll see that the correct profiles are available, including all the way up to the newest 17134. However, there is another problem. Let's first look at the version of volatility that ships with the SIFT workstation. And we'll go ahead and do a dash H and grep for mal, which will show us the plugins that start with mal. And we see mal find, mal find deep, if we look down, we'll see malprocfind, which happens to be the first plugin that we're going to be running. Now let's go back to where we were and look at the new version that we just pulled down from the GitHub repo. And when we do that, we'll unfortunately see that there is only one matching entry for mal, which is simply malfind. So now the question becomes, how do we get that mal proc find plugin that we want to run so that we can use it with the new version of volatility we just pulled down. Well, fortunately, it's fairly simple. What we'll need to do is go ahead and change into the volatility directory underneath volatility. And then you'll notice that there is a plugins directory. And then within the plugins directory, there's actually a malware directory. And within here, you'll actually see the malfind plugin that we just looked at but you'll notice there are no other M plugins. Now, it just so happens that this path that you see on screen is the location of the malproc find plugin on the SIFT workstation. So what we'll do is copy this path and we'll simply copy that plugin into this directory. And now when we've done that, you'll notice that we have the malproc find plugin here. 
Let's go ahead and change the permissions to match the other ones, which would be 664. And then we'll do malproc find. And now we have both malfind and malproc find. The PYC file will be generated the first time we run it, so don't worry about that. Now let's go back into the root of the volatility directory from the GitHub version. And this time we'll once again run python vol.py. And now we should be able to use that plugin. So we'll go ahead and do a dash H rep for mal. And finally we see our mal proc find plugin. So now we are ready to get started. Now first a bit about mal proc find. This is actually a fork of the original malsysproc plugin, and it should not be confused with the aforementioned malfind plugin, which actually helps us find hidden and injected code. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So to run this, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and change up to the root of the directory where we've got our memdump file, and I'll simply call python volatility slash vol.py, which again is the one that we just pulled down from GitHub. We'll specify the file, which is of course memdump underscore win 10 x 64 underscore 15063.mem. The profile is of course win 10 x 64 underscore 15063. And then lastly, the plugin that we want to run is malproc find. And now we're starting. Now I can tell you this is going to take quite a while to run. So what we'll do is we'll cut the video here and come back when it's finished so you don't have to sit here looking at the screen waiting on it. And we'll analyze the output of malprocfind and see if we see anything that might be a bit suspicious. We'll go ahead and from that point pivot and look deeper at the processes that might be of particular interest to us. So let's go ahead and let this run and we'll come back momentarily when it's finished. And here we see the results of the malprocfind plugin. This ended up taking several minutes to run, and you do see that there are a couple of warning messages displayed here. That's not entirely unexpected. Keep in mind that as of the recording of this video, the malprocfind plugin has not been updated in quite a while, and we are using this to analyze a relatively new build of Windows 10, so occasionally there are issues parsing some of the artifacts from those newer memory images. That said, it does appear that we have quite a bit of valid data that's been returned, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we have. We are primarily looking for false values in the columns, but we have to take that with the context around the other values in the columns. In other words, just because we see a false does not mean the process is evil. However, if we see a given process that has multiple false values across these various columns, that might warrant further investigation. We have offset, process name, PID, parent PID, name, path, and so on across the top. And as we start to look down, you'll notice multiple svchost.exe processes, which is quite normal on a Windows system. You'll also remember that that's a favorite for malware authors because it is so ubiquitous. They often like to create rogue SVC host.exe processes so that they can hide in plain sight. Oftentimes you'll find those processes in incorrect paths or maybe there'll even be a slight name variation like scvhost.exe or something like that. With that in mind, as we start to go down from the top, the first thing that catches my attention is PID 2888 because we have multiple false values in these columns, starting with the parent PID. The parent PID should be for SVC host.exe, services.exe. This indicates that's not the case here. The path should be system root system32, but it must not be for this particular process. The command line is also wrong. The user is wrong. The time is listed as false. This is a little less concerning because it is common for SVC host.exe processes to be started well after the system boots, so that's not quite as concerning as the other values. CMD is also listed as false, so we have multiple false values across these different columns for PID 2888. 
Now I assure you there's plenty of other interesting things to find throughout this memory image, and we'll talk more about that at the end of the video. But for now, let's focus our attention on PID 2888, and I've already done a little bit of pre-work to speed things up for us. What we're going to do now is take a look at what PID 2888 is. So I ran a PS list, as you can see here, grepping for that PID number. And you'll see that this line returned, of course, SVC host.exe. And you'll notice the parent PID is listed as 7416. Now, again, for a legitimate SVC host.exe process, that should be services.exe. But when I grepped for 7416, I see that it's actually cmd.exe, which has no business spawning a legit SVC host.exe process. So immediately I'm concerned here. The other interesting thing is that I see an LSA ISO.exe process here. We should only expect to see LSA ISO.exe on a system running Credential Guard. And I can assure you Credential Guard was not enabled on this machine. So something is not right with LSA ISO.exe and certainly that's something I want to look more into. So now let's take a look at the command line, which as you'll recall was listed as false for PID 2888. To do that, we'll type in the CMD LINE plugin and we'll go ahead and grep for 2888. Now, when we do this, you'll notice that we don't quite get the output that we want. So we're going to have to modify that grep statement ever so slightly so we can see exactly the output we're interested in. So I do see svchost.exe PID 2888. But if we go ahead and do an A1 here, which means show me the matching line plus one line after it. By the way, B would be before and C would be X number of lines before and after. So when I do an A1 there, I can see the command line for this PID. And you'll notice that it looks quite odd. First off, we can immediately see it's running out of the wrong directory. It should not be in Windows. It should be in Windows System 32. There also appears to be two spaces here then a dash K and network service. Now it is common to see the dash K and I believe network service is a valid flag here that we would expect to see after dash K, but still something doesn't look right about this. And of course it's running out of the wrong directory. So that is indeed interesting. What about the other PID? That was 3456, which is our LSA ISO.exe process. Let's take a look at that, 3456. And again, we're using the A1 with grep, which will show the matching line and one line after it. So let's see what we have here. Here we have C colon backslash windows, this time with a capital W, and then LSA ISO.exe. This is the wrong path. Again, this should be Windows System 32 if this were a legitimate LSA ISO.exe process. And even then, it shouldn't be running because Credential Guard is not running for this system. So something is very odd with both of these. So the next thing we're going to want to do after we've identified our suspicious processes, and again, there are several other suspicious processes here. In the interest of time though, we'll go ahead and move on to the next step. And that would be to look at the associated network traffic. So in the next section of the video, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use volatility to look at network related traffic from this memory image. Now it's time to take a look at one of my favorite volatility plugins, which is NetScan. If we repeat our last command and get rid of CMD line and replace it with NetScan, piping the results through more, we'll look at the network connection related data associated with this memory image. This will take a few seconds to run and then we'll see what we have. Across the top, you'll notice we have offset, protocol, local address, foreign address, state, PID, owner, and even a created date and timestamp. 
you may not have known that there actually is date and time related information for our network connections. So that could be very handy. So we see quite a few things that appear to be communicating on TCP 80 and TCP 443, which of course is probably not unexpected on a given endpoint such as this. But one of the things we may want to look for is anything that is communicating on either of those two ports that is not a web browser or any web browser that is communicating on anything other than those two ports. Either of those things would be considered abnormal in most environments and may be something that would warrant further investigation. We could also take a look at what's listening on the system or take a look at the established connections on a system. And we could also feed the results of what we see here into something like a Bebus, which is a Python script that I wrote that will actually parse IPv4 addresses out of given input and perform GeoIP lookups on those addresses, providing things like the autonomous system number from which the IP address is allocated and various other pieces of information that would be useful in an investigation. So we could go in many different directions here, but I think what we'll do now is actually grep for the word established. So let's take a look at what is actually an established connection at the point at which this memory image was collected. We'll give this a few seconds to run. And here we see quite a bit of traffic, which at first glance, the vast majority of is associated with 80 and 443. On the far right, we see SVC host.exe, which again is not unexpected. We see Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome. So what about anything that is established that's not TCP 80 or 443, just to look for any immediate outliers? So we'll do a grep minus V to exclude 80 and to exclude 443. And now let's give this a few seconds and see what we're left with. And we have one match. And it looks like it's TCP 4444. That should mean something to you. That is indeed Meterpreter. And that's not what we want to see on a system. That's bad news. It's associated with PID 9316 and PowerShell.exe. So clearly this is something that would be very worrisome and something that we would definitely want to investigate. And again, just from left to right, we see the offset, we see that it's TCP, we see the source address and source port, the destination address and destination port, the fact that it is an established connection at the point at which this memory image was gathered, we see the PID and the associated process. So again, there are plenty of other directions we could go here. We have a wealth of data to investigate and there are plenty of things here that might be considered abnormal. So we would definitely want to run some scripts and some analysis to see what other things might be warranting our investigation. Now, after analyzing the network traffic, we would next most likely want to look for evidence of code injection or process hollowing. Plugins such as the aforementioned Malfind as well as hollow find can help us with these actions. In the interest of time, we're not going to cover those in this episode. However, we do cover both of those plugins in the Windows memory analysis episode, which I'll link to in the video's description. So if you're not familiar with code injection and process hollowing, the differences between them, or the malfind or hollow find plugins, I would strongly encourage you to check out that episode which again is called Windows Memory Analysis. You'll find a link in the video's description. But in the next and last section of the video, we're going to take a look at a couple of plugins that can actually help us extract some of the data associated with these suspicious processes from this memory image so that we can do things like reverse engineer or provide additional investigative methods and techniques to help us determine what has happened. So let's take a look at that next. As one of the last steps in our investigation, we're going to want to take all of the suspicious processes that we've identified and actually dump the process binaries to disk and the memory associated with those processes to disk. We can use the proc dump and mem dump plugins respectively 
to do that. Now we have covered those two plugins in previous episodes in this series, but as a refresher, we'll go ahead and look at both again. At this point, we've identified three PIDs that warrant our attention. They are 2888, which was the svchost.exe process that we first identified as being rogue, 3456, which was our lsaiso.exe process, and then 9316, which was associated with powershell.exe and that interpreter connection on TCP 4444. Now we're not going to look through both plugins for all three processes, but instead we'll focus on that first 2888 process. If we go back to our last command, which was netscan, we'll go here and we'll replace that with proc dump. We'll specify PID 2888, and then we'll specify our dump directory as the current directory. This will tell Volatility to use the proc dump plugin to dump only PID 2888 to the current directory. So let's give this a couple of seconds to run, and it's already done. Let's go ahead and run file against this, and we'll see this is indeed a PE32 executable. So at this point, we could take this into our favorite reverse engineering platform, such as IDA or Binary Ninja, and take a look at the capabilities associated with this malware, or at least what we think is malware. And then as far as memdump, the syntax is almost the same. Instead of proc dump, we'll simply replace this with memdump, and we'll dump the memory associated with PID 2888. So let's give this a couple of seconds to run. And we're done. Now, of course, if we run file against this, you'll notice that it does also say that it's a PE32 executable. If we look at both the executable and the dump, you'll notice, of course, they are vastly different in size. This is all of the memory associated with that particular process, and this is just the binary itself. Now, we would want to do the same thing for PID 3456 and PID 9316, and then, of course, we'll want to perform analysis and investigation on those, which is a little beyond the scope of this video, perhaps better suited for the Introduction to Malware Analysis series. So at this point, that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to show you in this video. However, there is something else. So, spoiler alert, there are plenty of other interesting things to find in this memory image. And at this time, I'm actually going to include a link in the video's description so that you can download it and walk through these steps yourself. And while we're at it, how about a contest? The first person that pulls the password for the 13 cubed user account within this memory image and DMs it to me, again, direct message on Twitter, at DavisRichardG, will win a free 13 cubed t-shirt. And these aren't crappy, low-quality t-shirts. We have actually very high-quality shirts. And we have both men and women sizes available and a couple of different designs you'll be able to choose from. So again, I would encourage you to look at the video's description and download the memory image so you can follow along with the video and take a look at the other things located here because there's plenty of other things to play with. There is no actual malware contained within this memory sample, so you're not going to harm your system, but it will be good practice for you. So that wraps up this video, and as always, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this. Please like, subscribe, and share, and if you're able, please consider donating on Patreon to help support this channel. You'll get early access to videos and much more. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next one.